by Twitter. And we are broadcasting on our other platforms as well, on Facebook, on our Facebook page and Facebook group. So if you don't know who I am, my name is Joel Setacase, and I am the president and executive director of an organization called the Think Institute. We're a Christian educational and evangelistic ministry that helps Christian laymen to become the Christian worldview leaders their families and churches need. And we're doing this Twitter space right now because this is an incredibly popular and incredibly relevant and powerful topic. And so if you are right now watching on our other platforms, if you're watching on the Think Institute Facebook page, or if you're watching in the Think Squad Facebook group, or if you're watching on YouTube, let me just encourage you to hop over onto Twitter right now and look up, look me up. My name is on Twitter. It's Think Inst. And I'm going to put a banner up here for you. Think Inst. Go check me out and join the space on Twitter if you have a Twitter account and join the conversation. We've already got people hopping on here. Hello to Steven and hello to uh, Robert. And looks like we've got uh, Mac, uh, Ben Kissling is here. So uh, thank you guys for joining. And of course, I am joined by my co-host, Apologetai. Apologetai, how are you doing, brother? Hey, Joel. Thanks for having me on. I'm doing great. It's good, man. I'm so glad that you're joining us again. This is this is incredible. This is the second Twitter space that we're doing together. Uh, the last one we did, of course, was on the topic of presuppositional apologetics. And we were joined by Andrew Rappaport of Striving for Eternity, a friend of mine. And um, that w- I, I think that one went really well. And I, I knew that when I was going to do one on the age of the earth, I had to have you on, brother, because you are a guy who is very thoughtful and you write and talk about this stuff all the time. In fact, recently when I asked you, are, how do you feel handling the scientific stuff? You said um, you're very comfortable with all the stuff that I had put into the research document. So thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me on again. I enjoyed the presuppositional apologetic conversation. In fact, I, I still haven't caught up on my sleep yet. You <laughs> run that show so late, I think we could have done it a five-part episode on presuppositional apologetics. It's so much fun to talk about, but I enjoy talking about young earth creationism too. So again, thanks for inviting me. This ought to be fun. All right. Excellent. Excellent. Well, um, just to uh, lay out some ground rules here for the folks listening at home, if you're listening on Twitter, which is really the best way to listen, um, then, and you want to talk, you want to pipe up and uh, say your piece there, you can request to be a speaker. And if you request to be a speaker, I can't guarantee that we'll call on you, but um, but I'm definitely very open to having other people join the conversation and say what is on your mind or ask a question. We're, we're aiming more for questions here as opposed to if you just want to vent your spleen, hey, listen, have your own Twitter space. But uh, if you have some questions, you want to get into the conversation, if anything is unclear, um, uh, or you want to challenge anything that's said, you know, that is that is fine from a question perspective. Now, um, why is this topic relevant? Well, I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lay out m- what my perspective is, and then Apologeta, I'd like you to jump in as well. But why is this um, an important topic? Here's why I think this is an important topic. I don't think that it's a salvation issue in, in, in that if you deny a young earth view of the age of the earth that you will go to hell or you're somehow not saved and not a Christian or you don't love Jesus Christ or you're not born again. I'm, I'm never going to say that. However, this does matter to us as Christians because if the Bible is teaching a young earth perspective and we believe the Bible as followers of Jesus Christ, then it is part of Christian faithfulness and, um, and uh, discipleship to believe what the Bible says. And not only that, but all of all of Scripture is true and it's good for us. Jesus himself said that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. 
So if this is from God, then this is life for us. This is life giving for us to know this, to believe this, to understand this. And then there are all kinds of practical applications as well. If you, if, if you get the age of the earth wrong, it's going to affect how you do science. It's going to affect how you view your place in the world. It's going to affect how you view um, where you came from and what your purpose is and where you're going. And so we, um, we need to get this right. Um, and, and not only that too, but you know, my mission is to help Christian men to become the worldview leaders that their families and churches need. And this is a really important question because your kids are going to ask this, your friends are going to ask this, your non-Christian coworkers and your Christian coworkers are going to ask this. So if you want to become the, the worldview leader that your family and church need, this is a really important question to be able to ask. How old is the earth? Apologetic, why would you say that this is an important matter for us? Joel, I agree with you very much in the way you described a lot of that. Uh, and I agree 100%. This is not an issue regarding salvation. People uh, are not saved by the correct quantity of information they have. We're saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. And praise God for that, because I'm not nearly smart enough to save myself, and no one is smart enough to save themselves. Uh, and regarding this, specifically this idea of the age of the earth, I don't necessarily care. I know this may shock people. I don't necessarily care about the age of the earth, except that's what the Bible seems to say. Right. And we, re we read through it, and we understand Scripture as a whole. What falls out is what we call the young earth model. So the age of the earth in and of itself isn't important, except that's what the Bible says. And we want to be faithful and consistent interpreters of Scripture. There are questions, and when we have the, we bring those questions to Scripture and we look for a consistent understanding of what the Scriptures say, then it looks like what we understand in the young earth model to be saying. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's good. And just, just from the standpoint that we want to believe scripture, we want to do what it says. We want to know what so it that's says. That's what matters to me. It's, it's, it's really an issue of consistent biblical interpretation. Yeah, that's good. Just from the perspective of wanting to believe and understand scripture. Um, and, and as Christians, you know, uh, one, one misconception that people have is that there's, the there's the world of religious doctrine on the one level and then in a totally separate level there's the world of hard scientific facts and the two worlds are viewed as non-overlapping magisteria meaning they are areas of knowledge and study and research that have nothing to do with each other you've got theology on the one hand and you've got science on the other and uh, this this is an idea that is at least as old as the enlightenment and it, I would dare say it goes back even further. You see remnants or you see traces of it even in the ancient Greek philosophers. But uh, to any of our listeners who have ever read anything by Francis Schaeffer, you will recognize this as the two stories that he talks about, where on the, on the bottom, you've got the world of fact, the world of, of physical reality. You've got the world that we interact with on a daily basis. That is the supposed realm of science. And then on the upper level, you've got the realm of faith. You've got the realm of grace. You've got the realm of spiritual truth and biblical doctrine. And some believe and go through life thinking that it's possible for those two stories. Um, you can live all the way in the basement and you can, you can live upstairs, but, um, but you never have to travel from one to the other. And there's no overlap. There's no real way of getting from one to the other. And Francis Schaeffer took that down beautifully in his books like The God Who Is There and Escape from Reason, where he talks about how that's a it's a false conception of the world. Because as Christians, we believe that God made the whole world. He made the world of science, the physical reality that we interact with. He made the world of um, spiritual truths. And so the ultimate example, of course, of this is Jesus Christ himself, who is the son of God, the word, the principle that governs the whole universe. And the word became flesh. Jesus came and lived 
in our world. The Bible says he tabernacled among us, which means he 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 dwelt among us. And so the very incarnation of Jesus Christ, God himself, just blows up this two-story scheme. So what that means for us is this. People will say, well, the Bible's not a science textbook. Okay, granted, the Bible was not written to be a science textbook, but it also wasn't written to just tell us ethereal spiritual truth that have no bearing on our physical world. And so if the Bible says something about the world and its origins, we need to know what it says. We we um, we better unpack it. We better figure it out. So, um, man, I want to turn the mic over to you here, Apologetai. And um, we need to start with God's word. Before we even get into the science, before we get into um, the, the evidence from the natural world, we need to know what does the Bible actually say about the age of the earth? So where should we begin? Genesis? Yeah, right there in Genesis 1-1, it says... The- the earth was created in 4004 BC. I don't know what trans- translation you meant. <laughs> Wait, no, it, it doesn't say that. Does yours say that? Did Man, you- I got to get your no, translation. I'm just messing with you. I'm just messing with the, the group. No, I, I did like what you had to say that uh, the Bible is not a science book. And that's that's 100% agreement on our end. The, the Bible is not a, text, uh, uh, a science textbook. It is a history book. It's an account of history that God revealed about uh, his creation. And so when people look in the Bible and they look for this, this sci- where is the scientific account, some people get a little frustrated. Well, that, this isn't a scientific account. So to get my science, I have to go to what the secular world says about uh, the history of the universe. And I'm just going to redefine the text of Scripture to make it fit that. Right. And then I can have both. Then I can just – I can be uh, confident that the, the – the scientific world is is saying something, and I'll just redefine whatever the Bible had said, and maybe it said a day here or a year there, but that those people weren't very smart, and so God had to speak to them in riddles, and so we can just we can just redefine the word day to mean whatever we want, whatever right. matches with this modern paradigm that we're that we're in now. Right. And so there there are competing authorities for the history of of the universe. As someone who reads the reads the Bible in its in its context with the with the, the genre, the author's intent, it seems very clear that that author in Genesis one and then throughout the rest of Scripture that confirms this was communicating communicating to his readers that God created in six regular days, the days mm. that we experience now. And we can look, you know, I don't know if we wanted to, to read the text uh, or not during Ab- our- Absolutely. Yeah, let's do it. Let's let's absolutely read it and see what it says. So what, what passage should we read from right now? I'm going to pull it up. Well, the, we, could, we could start with the creation account. Why not start right at the beginning? Love it. <laughs> because in, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Mm-hmm. Now the earth was formless and empty darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good. We'll come back to that when he sees something that it is good. Yeah. And he separated the light from the darkness and God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. We can probably spend some time talking about that repeated line as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's just keep reading. We'll keep going. And God said, let there be an expanse between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the expanse and separated the water under the expanse from the water above it. And it was so. And God called the expanse sky. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. So just so you know, I'm reading out of uh, the NIV. Okay. Uh, I do like the ESV as well. I think the ESV has a really good translation. Uh, any thoughts on that so far? No. Well, okay. You know what we need to do is we need to figure this. So let, let's start with those first three words in the beginning, because when it says in the beginning, what maybe we ought to just call, um, maybe we just ought to make the obvious call here. What is that saying in the beginning of what? 
the the current age or is this an absolute beginning to space time if we continue reading uh, all the way through and get to exodus when exodus 20 pops up it says um, getting at Exodus 20, verse 9. Six days you shall labor and do your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither your your son or daughter, nor your manservant or maidservant, nor your animals, nor your alien within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Hmm. So it looks like when we com combine the uh, understanding of those two passages that this is the beginning of space time. God created everything within those six days, the, the days that he expected his people to work that same amount of time hmm. that they were to work and then rest was the same amount of time that he took to create essentially all things the heavens the earth the sea and all that is in them and if we want to extrapolate a little bit to colossians 1 where it says that the creator jesus created those things visible and invisible we can, we can make a, a pretty fair extrapolation that that is everything god created everything jesus the mm -hmm. creator created all things within six days yeah the heavens the earth the sea and all that is in them that, you know that that's a good point you're right because all things were created by him, both visible and invisible. And that's a great tie in and cross reference with John chapter one, John one, one through three talks about how in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was with God. He was with God in the beginning and all things through him, all things were made. And without him, not anything was made that has been made. John one is is an echo of that other passage you just read because uh it's it's describing that the word is the creator the word god created everything through the word and we find out the word is jesus and and john one again situates the the time frame of when this all happened as being in the beginning um and so so really all of creation is broken up into two categories. Sorry, all of reality and being is is divisible into two categories. There's things that were made and there's things that were not made. And those things that were, were made, that's creation, that's everything in it, heavens, earth, everything in them. And the things that were not made, that's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the three divine persons of the Godhead. There is one God th eternally existing in three divine persons. And, and so... Um, there was an absolute point at which God created the world. We know how he did it and we know when he did it. And it was at that absolute moment at the beginning of space time that Genesis talks about, that John talks about, and that is hinted at throughout the rest of scripture. Um, do you, do you agree with what I just said? Totally. Okay. Yeah, and then it Keep wasn't rolling. Just that, but he says, and the, after he had finished creating the light or energizing his universe, he says, now that is day one. Mm. Okay. Day one is, is the beginning as we move forward in time. Uh, I had a, had a friendly conversation with one of our listeners, Adam. So, hey, Adam, welcome to the uh, Twitter space. I'm glad you're here. I enjoyed our conversation that we got to have uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and this, this question came up of what, when was the beginning? Is the beginning separate from day one? And we, we had a little bit of discussion about that. And I kept pushing back on this idea that, that Exodus 20 helps us to understand if there is a question about the length of these days or when the days were, we can look in Exodus 20 and it tells us that the beginning, the time when the heavens and the earth were created, is covered in this Exodus 20 passage that says hmm. that the heavens, the sea, and the earth and all that is in them were created within those six days. So if there is a question, if we're looking for it, you know, a, a little segue here, we talk about this idea of interpreting correctly. Yeah. There are competing authorities for who gets to decide what's right. Okay. And in, in some of the most popular, uh, I guess the, the modern paradigm is science. Science gets to tell us hmm. what is right, what is wrong and what has happened. And right. that is a competing authority because there are, there are things that don't seem to uh, 
be consistent between what the Bible tells us and what the modern paradigm tells us. Yeah. Uh, and so when those things uh, inter- interact, who gets to who gets to be redefined? Right. Uh, do we redefine Scripture, or do we take what Scripture says and apply that to our understanding of of science and do and go forward? Mm. So those who would hold to science and want to redefine the Bible, a lot of times you'll hear them say, "Well, the day doesn't really mean day." Yes. There, there's flex, there's flexibility within that word day because like in my father's day doesn't mean a, a 24 hour day. That's right. true. And, right. the, and the, the Hebrew word for day, Yom, has that flexibility. We can we can see there are places in scripture, even in in the uh, passage in Genesis two in Genesis two, four, it says uh, in the day that the, the heavens com- uh, that the Lord completed let's see here. Uh, uh, and this is the account of the heavens is when the Lord made the heavens and the earth mm-hmm. uh, in that day wasn't a single day. He, he used six days to do it. Right. So if there is question about the flexibility, how, what, what is the length of the day in Genesis one? How do we, how do we determine what that length is? Yeah. Well, we look, we can look somewhere else in scripture that defines those days very clearly. And that's that Exodus 20 passage. Okay. Exodus so 20 tells us in six days and we know they're regular yes, days yes. because that's the same amount of time that God told his people you have to work before you rest. Okay, so so we, we've got a couple things going on here. One, we do have in the immediate context of Genesis 1, we do have a situation where the word yom or day is used in, in the, well, I would say in different senses, but someone could point to it and people do point to it and they go, look, Genesis 2 says in the day when God created the world, well, we're not talking about a single day, so clearly we're talking about a um, a period of time. And if Genesis two can use Yom as a period of time, why can't Genesis one? And so, so that's hanging out there. But then we get we're going to let Scripture interpret Scripture, which is known as the analogia fide or the analogy of faith. Analogy of faith. Analogy is when you compare one thing to another. The analogy of faith is when you compare one part of Scripture to another part of Scripture. It's a very important principle for us as we're interpreting Scripture. So when we go to Exodus and we see the Lord saying in Exodus to the Israelites, in six days the, the, the Lord created the heavens and the earth and all that is in them, then now we're getting Scripture's own interpretation, which is the Lord's own interpretation of what's happening in Genesis one. So just because Genesis two uses the word yom in an in a non twenty four hour way, that doesn't mean automatically that that's what's going on in Genesis one. And then Exodus twenty is further evidence that that's not what's going on in Genesis one. But there's something else too, right? Uh, uh, Apollo Jedi in in Genesis one, there's a certain format in which God describes the days: evening, morning and a sequential number. Can you talk about that? What is the significance of God describing the days in that format? Do you know yeah, what I'm talking about? I, totally. But before I go there, I want to uh, mention that why do the, uh, the the young earth skeptics always point out Genesis 2-4 as being the use of day in a non-literal sense? Well, they do that because it sticks out as unusual. <laughs> Genesis 1 isn't unusual. Genesis 1 uses the, the word yom, day, mm. in a very normal format, the way we would expect a literal use of 24 hours. So they don't ever say, well, look at Genesis, the figurative use of Genesis 1, whatever. Mm. They always go to Genesis 2, 4. See how it's – and it's the reason they do that is because it sticks out as mm. figurative, as unusual in this context. Genesis 1 – uses those days in a very literal way. So yes, and going back to what you were saying about the uh, the evening and the morning, well, that's a, that's the boundary of a, a regular day, the way we understand days now. Yeah. I ask people, I ask people several times, uh, you know, if, if if I were to be uh, to ask an old Earth person, someone who believes in an old Earth, what uh, a, what changes would need to be made to the Bible for me to believe in an old earth. Well, I could name dozens and dozens of changes. Mm. The, the, the fact that God used day, the, uh, all these, 
these things that that seem to stick together uh, real well for young Earth are real problems and need to be redefined for an old Earth. But if I turn that around and ask an old Earth person, what would you need to change the Bible if God truly did want to communicate a young Earth hmm. six thousand years ago in six days? What would what would, what text in the Bible would need to be changed yeah. to to accommodate that view? And I've gotten a few little things about, well, maybe on the seventh day it doesn't have the markers for evening and morning. Right. And I've gotten little things like that, but they're they're really just nitpicking at the edges. Mm -hmm. There's no there's no real changes that need to be made to the Bible yeah. for God to have been more clear in his communication that it was the young earth, what we what we understand to be this young earth position. Okay. Let me jump in right there. We do have someone who wants to to hop on. Uh, ben Kissling. Before he comes on, though, apologize. I've got a. I, I want to point something out here, and I'm going to put my pastor hat on, or maybe this is my theologian hat. And here's what I'm going to say. In Exodus 20, it says, "In six days, the, uh, the Lord created the heavens and the earth." Now, if you ask a kid, you, you ask a, a child who's been in Sunday school, you say, "In how many days did God make the world?" More often than not, the answer that you will get is. Seven, most of the time, oftentimes anyway, at least in my experience, people will say, God made everything in seven days. And it's not just kids, adults will say this as well. But that is a fundamental error because, and you know, you want to be nice when a kid says that. You go, oh, you're very close. Yes, it was one week. But what does the Bible say? God made the world and the heavens, everything in them, in six days. And that is very clear, I would say, from Genesis 1. But the seventh day throws people off because, as you just mentioned, Apologetai, there is no ending. There's no recorded ending of that seventh day. Now, I'm going to say two things about that very, very quickly. One, that is not a problem. It doesn't do anything to affect our interpretation because... The Bible does not claim that God created the world in seven days. The Bible created the world. The Bible claims that God created the world in six days, and those six days are all numbered with an evening and a morning. So there's no problem there. But then the question is, well, what about the seventh day? Why didn't God close off the seventh day in the narrative? Why didn't He say, "And there was evening and morning on the seventh day"? Well, one, because He didn't have to, because that seventh day was not a day of creation; it was a day of rest. And then you, and then you have to say this. What's different about the seventh day from all the other six days, other than the fact that God's not creating on it? Here's what it is. All the other six days are differentiated from one another because God is doing something different on each of those days. So it's very important that God, um, that God delineates between day one and day two, day three and day four. But by the time you get to the seventh, guess what? There is no difference between what God is doing on the seventh day and the eighth day. There's no difference between what God is doing on the eighth day and the ninth day or the 10th day or the 11th day or the 12th and so on and so forth. What do I mean by that? Here's what I mean. On the seventh day, what did God do? He rested. He rested from all his work. All right. What did he do on the eighth day? Still resting. What did he do on the ninth, nine thousandth day? He was still resting. And this, not only is this historically important because from that, you can get all kinds of wonderful historical doctrines like the preservation of matter and energy and um, you know, no new matter and energy are ever created. So God is not creating new things. But also there's a profound theological truth in this because by the time you get to the Psalms, you have the psalmist saying, today, if you, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as they did in the wilderness. And, and the author of Hebrews picks up that theme in Hebrews chapter 4 and says that there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. In other words, God, who ceased from his work after six days and started resting on the seventh day, continues resting from his work till this very day. And the theological import of that is that those who cease from their striving and rest and trust in Christ are entering into the very rest of God. They, they are able to enjoy the Sabbath rest that comes in Jesus Christ. So God started resting 6,000 years ago on the seventh day, give or take. We get to cease from our work, spiritually 
speaking in a meritorious sense, in a salv- salvific sense. We get to stop working as if our works are going to merit our salvation, and we get to rest in Christ today. And it's the same rest that God started 6,000 years ago. So there's so much deep, rich theology in this that if God were to have closed off the seventh day in the narrative, if he had said, and God rested from his work, there was evening and morning, the, the seventh day, in other words, the seventh day is over. We would not get all this amazing gospel truth and gospel theology that we get in Hebrews 4, in the Psalms. So, and 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 again, beyond that, God didn't need to close off that day. He'd already established how many days it took to create the world in the six days. So God is doing more here than just giving us an account of how many days he created the world in. He's also setting us up for for the gospel. He's setting us up for the rest we get to have in Christ. I'm glad you added that, Joel. I think that's uh, very good and very important for us to understand as well. Did you want to uh, let the other person come in and speak? You know what? I, I the question? Yes, I do. So this is Ben Kissling. And um, he requested to speak, and he brought he brought something up about the genealogies in Genesis five and eleven. So let's move out of Genesis one, and let's go to Genesis five and eleven. And um, these are what's called the chronogenealogies. And I'm gonna I'm gonna um, I'm gonna invite him to speak right now. So Ben, I just sent you a link, brother. Um, I sent you an invitation. Hopefully that worked. Um, I don't know if you got the invitation or not, but um, uh, Ben Ben brought up the fact that the earth is 6,000 years old because of the genealogies in Genesis 5 and 11. So, uh, Brother Ben, if you are able to come on, go ahead and accept that invitation. Um, and while, while he is figuring that out, because he also sent a tweet, he said, how does this spaces thing work? So... Uh, he might be having some trouble figuring this out. Um, But while he's doing that, why don't we go ahead and get started and talk about Genesis 5 and Genesis 11, these chronogenealogies. Apologize, what the heck is going on in Genesis 5? What's going on in Genesis 11? Why is this important to us? Ben, when you get connected, feel free to interrupt me at any time so we know you're connected, but I'm just going to Keep talking because we don't want any dead space. You know how that is. That's right. No dead space. That's right. (laughs) So uh, the importance of it is not so much what uh, God is trying to. God is communicating the line of the seed. When we when we look back at Genesis three in the fall, the proto evangelicum, the Genesis three fifteen, where God promises He's going to send someone to crush the head of the serpent. Mm. That's one of the most important parts of Scripture. And one of the one of the verses I have written even before Genesis one one, I've got written at the top of my Bible. It says Luke twenty four twenty seven, and this is a, the the passage where Jesus is walking with the two disciples to on the road to Emmaus, and He says in there that. In Luke 24, he says he explained the scriptures from the law and the prophets that everything is about Jesus. And so when we read through when we read through the Bible, we want to be sure that we understand that everything is about the glory of Jesus Christ. Yeah. If anything is uh, about me or anything else, if it's about you know trying to input, input, uh, we hear it all the time people putting themselves in scripture. What is your Goliath? <laughs> the story is not about Goliath and David. The story is about Jesus and honoring Jesus. And he, so anyway, as we look through the, the Genesis 5 uh, chronogenealogies, it's the line of the seed. And at every point, is this going to be the chosen one? Is this going to be the chosen one? And so God is recording this line all the way to Jesus to say, is, is was this the promised one? And it looks like maybe Noah. Maybe Noah is going to be this promised one who crushes the head of the serpent. Right. And Noah does bring comfort. Yeah. Noah, Noah, Noah brings salvation for the people in the midst of a, of a broken and fallen and wicked world. Mm-hmm. But Noah is not the promised one. And so we see this line, this unbroken line from Adam to Noah in Genesis 5. And then it picks up again in Genesis 11. That continues on this, this table of nations after Babel through the line of Seth. And, or the line of, well, Seth. And then to yeah. Noah's son Shem, down to Abram, where God makes a covenant with Abram, and uh, we we pick up there. So the, the importance of that 
is who is Jesus? Jesus is related all the way back through to Adam. The Adam is the, the first Adam, or yeah. the first man. Yeah. Uh, Jesus being the second Adam, the one who did it right. Adam failed in his responsibility to take dominion over the garden, mm-hmm. to protect his wife, to protect creation, who God had set up as the federal head. And when Adam fell, we all of Adam's descendants fell as well. We, we were part of that, that fall, so we're born into sin. Yeah. We sin because we're sinners. And then Jesus did it right. The second Adam, he kept the law perfectly. He never failed. He honored uh, his father at all points of his life with his heart, soul, mind, and strength that never failed at one point. So he could be the kinsman redeemer because he's related to Adam by blood. Mm -hmm. And because he kept the law perfectly, he's the only one who could uh, offer himself as a, as a perfect sacrifice because if it weren't for that, if he weren't related all the way back through to Adam, and he wasn't a kinsman and redeemer, then none of the descendants of Adam could be saved either. And I went kind of fast, so I don't know if you want to put your pastor's hat on and and speak (laughs) to that a little bit, but I think this is real important for us to understand that that this is real history. Yes. When when people want to unhinge Genesis from it, uh, history and make it sound like it's a, a mytho history. I think uh, you know. I think William Lane Craig is a super smart guy. Yeah. But, well, I really think he misses this theological point that it is so important that Genesis is not just some unhinged fabrication myth that uh, doesn't doesn't connect to history at all. Because history is is very important. It's throughout the Bible yeah. from Genesis uh, Chronicles. Uh, has this same uh, genealogies all the way back to Adam. And then we see it again in Matthew and Luke and this importance of tying Jesus and the, the glory of Jesus all the way back to the fallen Adam. Mm-hmm. So yeah, put your pastor's hat on there. Speak a little bit to that. No, that listen, that's wonderful. Um, we, we needed, we needed a high priest to relate to us in every way. Okay, what am I referencing here? I'm talking again about the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews is just an absolutely amazing book because it talks about the supremacy of Jesus Christ when compared to angels and priests and prophets, even great prophets like Moses and lawgivers like Moses. And it talks about how Jesus is absolutely supreme to all of them. And so Jesus being supreme is is above us he is higher than us and you might ask the question well how can someone like that possibly relate to me and my experience how can he take on my sin and shame he's so much above me he's a, i can't relate to him i don't know what it's like to be god almighty to be the greatest human being to ever live i don't know what it's like to be supreme I, uh, you know i'm i'm a, a dirtbag you know <laughs> like How can Jesus relate? Well, Jesus became like us and shared in our human nature. He was tempted in every way, just as we are, and yet without sin. And one of the things that scripture does is it establishes this point in various ways. It tells us straight up, Jesus shared in our human nature. He became a man. But we also see this play out in real time in the genealogies of um of Jesus and of his ancestors. So uh, right now I'm in a Bible study with a couple of guys, a few guys from church, and we are reading through the book of Matthew. And we're using the think method, which uh, if anyone's interested, you can go and get on the think.institute slash think method. It's a method of studying scripture that I developed, but we are, um, we're studying through Matthew and uh, excuse that shameless plug, by the way, we're, we're studying through Matthew. And in the beginning of Matthew, you get this genealogy. And when you read the genealogy, and and if you know your Bible, you will be just dumbfounded by the the personal histories of Christ's ancestors. These are people who were sinners. These are people who were, in in many instances, outcasts, half-breeds, people who had shame and sin intertwined into their story in a way that it is in, inextricable. Uh, even King David, the, the greatest king who ever lived, was a murderer and an, and an adulterer. And Jesus comes into the world and, and says, that's my lineage. 
Those are the people that I am associated with. Now, Jesus was without sin, but even, even the circumstances of Christ's own birth were culturally shameful. You know, he didn't have an earthly father. I mean, he had an adoptive father, yes. But when Jesus grew up, Jesus was, it, it, there seems to have been a rumor that Jesus was illegitimate. And, um, and we see that from some of the accusations, that, the insults that his enemies give him. Uh, why do I bring all this up? Because Jesus is a man who shares in our humanity in every way except sin, in, in every way except for actually sinning himself. And so, um, so I, I love what you're saying, and I love that we're emphasizing the human nature of Jesus Christ and just the, the actual earthy, historical person who is Jesus Christ. And before Jesus even entered the world, God was shaping the world and shaping human history in such a way that it would be the perfect place for Jesus to come. And along the way, God gives us these historical markers and these historical indicators to, to help us orient ourselves. And that is very important when we're reading scripture because Jesus came at the fullness of time. So time does matter. History does matter. I love what you said. Uh, William Lane Craig is a brilliant apologist. There's no way around it. I wish he was more presuppositional in his approach. But, um, but any, any Christian apologist or Christian thinker or scholar who downplays the historicity of scripture, in my humble opinion, is missing the mark by a long shot. And so let's talk about these chrono genealogies in Matthew or in Genesis 5, Genesis 11. Um, how do they help us orient ourselves? How do they, um, how do they, let's just ask point blank, how do they establish a young earth? the sons were born to the fathers and or grandfathers, we see that the time from Abram to Adam was on the order of 2,000 years uh -huh. when you add that up, give or take. And then from Abram to Moses is another 500 years or so. Mm -hmm. So adding that up and then the time from Moses forward uh, gives a, is a more uh, chronicled date outside of scripture. Right. Set, a chronicled set of dates outside. Of yeah. I, I lost you for. Oop. just a couple of years ago by uh, Dr. Robert Carter. He had a side podcast called the Equinox Project. Has anybody uh, ever heard of that? Uh, Apologetic, can can you pause for one second? Because my, my Twitter app just crashed and I was booted out from the space. I had to come back and I'm, I'm grateful that Twitter didn't cancel the space. But um, can you can you go back just really quick? Um, can we can we just rewind to when you were talking about the um, the distance from Abram to Moses we're talking about 500 years, give or take, and um, and we know from from Moses to Christ, we're looking at about 1,500 years, correct? Yeah, that's about 500 years. <laughs> I was having to rewind it there. Okay, okay. So, so uh, well, from from Moses to Christ is about 1,500 years. Yes. Correct. Okay, good, good, good. So, and then from from Jesus to now, of course, we know is about roughly 2,000 years. So all told, we add everything up together. Uh, we get a history of the world, a chronological history for the, from, from Adam to the current day, which as I'm speaking is April 20th in the, in the United States. And uh, we, we have, or 2023, that's about 4,000 or about 6,000 years, 4,000 years before Christ, 2,000 years since Christ. And um, is, there, is there any way around this? I mean, how... This seems so cut and dry, I apologize. Like, what do people say to contradict this? Well, the, the things I've heard most often are that there are missing, there are gaps in the genealogy. Okay. 
and uh, one of the one of the places they go is to uh, Matthew, and they say, "Well, look mm. in Matthew, there's yeah. there's a lot of skipped generations. We can look and see the the, the generations that uh, Matthew records. He he misses generations all over the place, and in fact, he's got a numbers. There's fourteen here and fourteen here and fourteen right. here, and uh, so." They try to say, well, there's, there's, there must be missing generations. There's gaps everywhere. Yeah. And so the pushback I get to them then is, well, who's missing? Mm. And it's just a blank face. Well, I don't know who's missing. It's just there's got to be gaps. And they'll always go back to their their source of authority, and they'll say, well, but because humans have been around for a million years since we split with monkeys, right? Or whatever, whatever authority they want to go to, they'll they'll throw that in there as the reason why there must be gaps that they they, re, they reveal their authority well there's got to be gaps because of and they'll insert their their authority there and you'll know immediately okay well that's that's your now your authority rather than scripture because there are if you want to assume there's missing gaps tell me who's missing and yeah. how you know dude that is such a good point because here when it comes to matthew we know what matthew is doing in his in his genealogies. Matthew says there are 14 generations from Abraham to David, 14 generations from David to the exile and 14 generations from the exile to Jesus Christ. Now it's proposed and posited and seems very likely that Matthew's audience was primarily Hebrew speaking Jewish people. Well, in Hebrew, and let's let's say that uh, Matthew's gospel may have originally been written in Hebrew. There's a lot of good evidence for that, but um, we can prove that or not. Which I don't think we can prove it, but whether or not that's true, his audience would have would have read his genealogy, and man, they would have known their scripture. They knew their Torah. They knew their Genesis five and eleven. They would have memorized large swaths of the Torah, maybe even all of the Torah or at least, at least uh, Genesis. So they're going to read that. They're going to go, wait a minute, Matthew, something's wrong. You're missing people. Oh, wait a minute. 14, 14, 14. Hmm. Using gematria, where, which is where we take letters and use them as substitute for numbers, um, using the Hebrew letters as numbers, when they double as numbers, how do we write 14. Well, we use the letters D, V, and D, the Hebrew versions of D, V, and D. D, V, D is how you write the word David without any vowels because words back then were, were written without vowels. And so you've got what Matthew is saying in his opening chronology, or his own opening genealogy rather, is you've got Jesus who you've got David generations, David generations, David generations, David, David David, one thing we know about scripture is when something is repeated three times, you better pay attention to it. So when the when the angels and the elders are surrounding the throne of God and they call him holy, 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 you pay attention to that. And when when Matthew says David, 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 uh, and you've you've already been tipped off to the fact that he's missing members that are ancestors that ought to be there in the genealogy, he's doing something there. What is Matthew doing? He's tipping off the reader that Jesus is the son of David, the son of David, the son of David, the son of David. You can't escape it. Now it's a little hidden. You got to kind of know what to look for, but it's there. And we know this because there's good scholarship behind this and, and pastors love to preach about this whenever they preach through the gospel of Matthew. I love preaching about this. I mentioned this when we did our, our Bible study, when we started our Bible study in Matthew 1, I talked about how it's David, David, David. So we know why Matthew excluded names from his genealogy. It's very clear. We don't have anything similar to that in Genesis 5 and 11, do we? No, sir. But I'm, I'm so glad you explained that. I you, you say it's real clear, but I don't speak Hebrew. Mm. So I'm glad you were able to enlighten your audience on this uh, Hebrew David. And as a, an aside, it looks like Ben may have gotten his speaker invitation good. He, I see him muted now. Oh. Rather than just, I'm going right. to mute myself and see if he can jump in. Ben, if you want to jump in. I got it, I got it to work on my phone app. Excellent. So. All right, brother, so, so, yeah, so jump uh, in. 
Yeah, so one of the things I always like to talk about, because it always comes up when you're talking to old earthers, is the history of Christian interpretations. Ben, real quick, the age of the earth. before you jump in here, Ben, uh, tell us uh, just real briefly, um, where, you, where are you calling in from? And um, what's uh, what's your interest in, I see on your profile there, you've got, you call yourself a young earth creationist. Is this something that you do full time as a hobby? Do you have a channel somewhere? Uh, this is a hobby. I have a podcast that's pretty new, so it's very small. What's the name of your podcast? Um, it's called Macro Macrophage Strategy. Okay. So if I like to say, if you can spell it, you're smart enough to listen to it. <laughs> well, cool. Well, just to make people a little smarter, that's M A C R O P H A G E Strategy. Go check out that podcast. Uh, it's Ben Kissling's podcast, Macrophage Strategy. Okay, cool. So that's your introduction, Ben. Um, so, so jump right in. And what do you want to say? Yeah, so I'm I'm in Dallas, Texas, and this has just been a interest of mine most of my life. So, but what I what I always run into with old earthers like our friend Adam here, who we have both talked to Apologetai. So our conversation will be out tomorrow, I think. Adam told me. Um, so all we need is me and Apollo Jedi to be on together and we'll have a triangle. <laughs> awesome. Um, but yeah, so there is a common myth among uh, old earthers that uh, the old earth interpretation of the Bible is ancient and that the young earth interpretation is a newer interpretation. Hmm. And this is especially, so for example, if you've seen Inspiring Philosophy's video on Young Earth Creationism, Michael Jones, he mentions the claim that uh, Young Earth Creationism comes from uh, the Seventh-day Adventist Church in the early 1800s. Mm. There's a few other versions of this, but so what I have done, and I have a podcast episode number four on this, is I went back and actually looked at a lot of the ancient write, Christian writings on the age of the earth, and I've compiled a ton of references to clear examples of ancient Christians calculating the age of the earth to be around 6,000 or under 6,000 years old, going all the way back to the second century. Hmm. And contrary to, so I can list off the ones that I have, Augustine, Young Earth creationist. Wait, wait, wait. Right. Let me stop you right there because Augustine is actually used for the opposition. Augustine, uh, yep. people people will say that Augustine did not believe in literal six days. He says uh, he says otherwise. So i just just curious. Sorry to interrupt you there, but uh, can you address that quickly? Because I know that someone's listening and making that objection silently, yeah. talking to their phones. Yes, Augustine. Yeah, you're right. Augustine is always the first one old earthers bring up, and sometimes they bring up Oregon as well. But what I said was is that Augustine is a young Earth creationist. That mm -hmm. means he believes the Earth was young. Okay. That says nothing about the length of the days. Okay. And Oregon is the same thing. I have quotes from both of them showing they both thought that the Genesis chronogenealogies should be interpreted to be a young Earth. And not only that, but in the passages where they say that, they're arguing against pagans who were claiming the earth was older. Hmm. So there's there were there were people who were objecting to the biblical chronologies even way back then in second and fourth and fifth centuries. And both Augustine and Oregon argued against those older uh, accounts of history because they didn't come from the Bible. Wow. Now, in terms of, and I can, I can, uh, again, if you look at episode four of my podcast, which is linked on my Twitter profile, so you can go right there. Mm -hmm. On episode four, I have all the references listed out. You don't even have to listen to the podcast. It's in the description and mm -hmm. there's links and everything because all this, all these texts are free online. And so it's not hard to read them yourself. Um, so, uh, yeah, so Augustine comes up every single time and the one they, the quote they always use, Augustine was, is weird because he wrote a lot on Genesis. He mm -hmm. wrote a lot in general, 
And his views changed a lot as he grew older uh, on a lot of different things, not just this. So as he grew older, Augustine changed his view to be a more literal interpretation. But the best evidence we have is that he thought that uh, creation was instantaneous. Right. And yeah, that that's important to know. It's not that he thought that it was millions of years. He thought he thought maybe God did it in an instant instead of six days. Right. And part of the reason he thought that is because he didn't know Greek, and he had a right. Latin translation of the New Testament that he was using. And there's a specific verse. I'm forgetting which one it was, but he misinterpreted it to mean that creation was instantaneous. Okay. Okay. So. So to um, to to nail this down a little bit, the the point that you're making here is that this idea of a young Earth is not new. It did not start with the Seventh Day Adventists. This is ancient. This goes back to the early days of the Church, um, probably as early as Christians were talking about these things. They've been espousing a young Earth. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct. In fact, I would go farther than that, and I would say there's zero evidence of an old Earth interpretation until the 1700s. Wow. And I've been saying this for a long time, and no one has ever given me any textual evidence that anyone, any Christian, ever interpreted the genealogies in Genesis 5 and 11 any differently than the young Earth interpretation. Hmm. So the issue of the days, right, which Oregon also Oregon was even more liberal than Augustine. Mm -hmm. Oregon thought that Genesis 1 through 3 was probably a fable or a myth and not actual history. But we have a quote from him showing that he believed that the earth was less than 10,000 years old, again, arguing against the pagan Celsus, or Celsus, however you pronounce that. Right. But um, so when it comes to the days... The issue of the length of the days for people like Augustine and Oregon, and we have examples, by the way, of ancient Christians who did believe in literal 24-hour days of creation, like uh, Basil of Caesarea, Irenaeus, and several others. Um, but the issue of the day, the length of the days was not connected to the age of the earth for them. Okay. Okay. So that was an argument that is new. That's the new argument. When we had the scientific claims about a vast age for the earth starting in about the 1700s some say with a geologist named james hutton mm -hmm. uh, some say it goes back a little farther than that but once we have those towards the early 1800s that's when you start having christians uh, starting to argue uh, that well maybe there's a whole bunch of time before the genealogies in genesis 5 start right the gap and theory. When, oh, right, and that's when they go back to Genesis one, yeah. and they try to put in that time into Genesis one because right. there's five days in Genesis one that is before the creation of Adam, which mm -hmm. is where the genealogy starts in Genesis five. Uh, right. Did you want to say something? No, you know what? That's that's a good point, and and I really appreciate you bringing this up. That's excellent, excellent information. Um, why don't you go ahead and put a put a, a bow on this and um, apologize? I and I need to move on to some some of the scientific evidence here, but uh, but but wrap this up for us. Bring this home for us here, Ben. Yeah. So the reason why the ancient interpretation is important is because that's before anyone had access to modern scientific information. Okay. And that, so it, we don't have to believe everything the ancient Christians believed about everything, right? They're not authoritative. Only the Bible is authoritative. Correct. But what it does mean is that prior to the advent of modern scientific estimates of the age, which has been, which has been changing basically every couple of decades for 200 years, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, <laughs> absent modern scientific evidence no Christian, there is no evidence that any Christian interpreted Genesis any other way than a young earth interpretation. Mm. That suggests to me that the reason why people are, in, are going with these old earth views is because they're trying to accommodate scientific evidence, not because they're trying to interpret what the text 
uh, really means. Uh, one more question here. Listen, uh, Ben, before you go, um, Curious Christianity is making comments on YouTube. And um, he asked this question. He said, uh, well, he asked, what about Jews? What about Jewish people? Uh, Maimonides believed that if science conflicted with the Bible, that one should side with science. He as well was open to the idea that the earth could be old. So is there a Jewish stream of thought that looks at Genesis and thinks uh, that could be, we could be looking at an old earth? Is it just the Christians who are peculiar in this? Are you aware of what the Jewish line of thinking was? I, am, I have not studied Jewish thinking, but I would be epically surprised if there were any old earth Jews in that same period or prior. Hmm. So, But I'd be open to looking at that. Maimonides was uh 12th century i believe so that's very very late yeah that's right the other, yeah the other christian authors late 12th century that's right so i don't have a, a direct answer to that no okay well joel i have a little bit of information we can add to that exact question you asked yeah do you want to know what the current hebrew year is aha uh -huh. what is it the current hebrew year is 5783 mm. as in 5,783 years after creation. So mm. there you go. I was going to actually point out to say a lot of people go, well, they, the Hebrews never uh, understood it that way. If you look at their context, they, they all believe in old earth, except that their calendar is actually tied to the date of creation about 6,000 years ago. I love that. I love how God puts these little jokes in history. Um, and he uses our our dating system to do it. Another great example of that is how we still refer to the current year as 2023. 2023 years since what? Oh, well, it's 2023 CE. Uh, it's not uh, it's not AD. It's CE. Oh, really? Well, so you're saying that there was a um, a, a shift between BCE and CE. What made that change? Was was there anything interesting or important that happened to 2023 years ago? And I just, I love this because you cannot escape. You cannot escape um, historical truth. It's embedded into our very dating system. And obviously that's not the authority scripture is, but I just love how God puts these little jokes in there that even the enemies of scripture, the opponents of scripture still date their calendars uh, set their appointments by the biblical timeline. I just think that's hilarious. Everything is about Jesus and Amen. his glory. Mm. Amen. All right. Well, uh, Ben, thank you so much for joining us, man. That was, that was super dupe for helpful. And um, I'd love to keep you on here and keep you, uh, keep you talking, but um, we need to move on because we got to talk about science and I've got about, like 23 minutes left here apologetai so why don't we um why don't we jump into some of these I, here's the thing i don't want to go into global flood territory and the reason why is because i think you and i could do another one of these and talk about <laughs> do, do you know what i'm saying like there i was just about to segue to the global flood no let's so do, do, good that you cut me off at the back don't, don't do it because i'm telling you we could spend like another two hours talking about the global flood. Um, what we need to do is I want to go to like, let's look at the hard science, the hard historical and, um, and biological and geological evidence that we see in the world today. I'm talking about things like sediment on the seafloor, I'm talking about one of my absolute favorite evidences for a young earth, which is soft tissue in fossils. And then, and then we can talk about magnetic fields or we can talk about ice cores because ice cores are brought up a ton, but here's the thing. We've got 22 minutes. So let's go into the lightning round here and just hit us with it, man. Like, like what do we need to know about the scientific evidence? Is there, is it just scriptural or is there hard scientific evidence for a young earth? All right, Joel, we're gonna, we want to set the foundation, we want to set the stage correctly when Please. we start talking about this evidence. Please. The, the, the best evidence for a young earth is God's Word. Amen. The Bible. And when, when there are discrepancies between what it, the modern paradigm interprets the evidence, we always go back to, well, 
that's not what the Bible says. So but, I want to I want to preface it with that. But that's not what but, Maimonides said. Maimonides said the opposite. So what do we do? Yeah, I, don't, I, I don't know. I can't even pronounce that name. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's true. So My, Maimonides is dead. Jesus is alive. Sorry, continue. But as we as we go into this, yes, there is evidence that does seem to point to a young earth. And, and one of the uh, the phrases I've heard are time limiting factors. Okay. What in the world is a time limiting factor? Uh, one of uh, the guys we we had on what was the guy's last name uh, last week that we had on the other Twitter space? Rappaport. Uh, Andrew, Andrew Rappaport. Andrew Rappaport. Mm-hmm. His best friend. We joke with him about that, not his best friend, uh, Dr. Jason Lyle. Yes, he uses, <laughs> that's right. He's his best friend. They hang out all he's the time. His best friend. They, they go they golfing. And, yeah. <laughs> he uses the word picture of a candle in a room. And if you say, well, how long has that candle been burning? Uh, you could calculate the amount of time you see that candle burn for one minute, and you can extrapolate that, that back in time. But if the candle is under a, uh, a shelf, that is only uh, four inches above it, you know the candle couldn't have burned beyond that. So the time-limiting factor for that candle is the shelf under which it sits. And there are many time-limiting factors we can look at uh, in the natural world, the the other part of the world, other part of God's revelation that coincides directly with Scripture. They're they're, they're in agreement. So we look at things like uh, short-term comets. There are comets that uh, go around the sun, but they have a lifespan, and those comets burn up as they travel around the sun. Mm. They can only be at the most about ten thousand years. So they uh, have to come from somewhere, or that God created them when He created the solar system, and they're burning out. But we've still got them. So the time limiting factor is the less than ten thousand years because those that long. Now wait a second, more... Apologetta, I, I got to okay. cut you off there, man, because. Isn't there an Oort cloud where comets are generated just out of our sight? That is one of the rescue devices from the old Earthers. And they, they try to say, well, there's an Oort cloud, except that the Oort cloud has never been observed. Mm. A, an astronomer by the name of something, something Oort, uh, mm-hmm. he thought maybe there must be something out there that's feeding the solar system with these new short-term comets. And so it is... Uh, a fabric to me it's a fabrication and, and it's the it's the kind of evidence we hear a lot of that it's outside the range of, of visible sight we can't see it so they can they can propose it but it's not true evidence yeah uh, this or cloud Jan Ort and Jan, there you go he proposed it in 1950 it's a theoretical concept so there you go yeah, never been observed so we can we can put that to the side because the the Oort cloud is uh fabricated like you said yeah uh, we can talk about uh, the human population growth, something that anybody can do on a, on a curve. If uh, you track it back in time, the, the growth rate of a population goes back. And from eight people getting off an arc about 4,500 years ago, our current population in 2023 ought to be about 8 billion. And that's about what it is. Mm-hmm. If humans had been around for a million years since a split with monkeys or what other, whatever other old earth model seems to be out there mm-hmm. uh where are all the people <laughs> there right. should the, the, the earth should be covered with people and yet uh it's only in these these last 4500 years after eight people got off the ark that we see a, a human population growth rate that equals what we have today and that's a that's a measurable uh, one that we can do uh, in an algebra class yeah there's a rescue device for that though too they say that there must have just been massive catastrophes that kept on eliminating the majority of the population but again those are unobserved fabrications right. It's, right. it's a rescue device right. and people will protect their worldview more that uh, they'll, they'll make up data to protect their worldview at any case and that's why we, you and I, Joel, are hold to uh, <laughs> presuppositional apologetics because yeah. evidentialism fails at that point where right. people try to protect their worldview. Yeah. Uh, you talked about, you know, my favorite is also the soft tissue and dinosaur bones. Oh, please talk about it. So in uh, the 1990s, a uh, lady by the name of Mary Schweitzer, Dr. Schweitzer, uh, was studying some dinosaur bones and she cracked open uh, one of the dinosaur bones. It was an accident, but it, what it revealed was that there was soft tissue inside and she mm-hmm. tested it and tested it over and over. And, uh, in the end, she had to conclude this is 
actual it wasn't a contamination in her lab results this was actual dinosaur soft tissue that she still holds has been able to be preserved for 65 million years so even the evidence of soft tissue being in a bone uh couldn't change her worldview that the world is uh very old and that dinosaurs died out over 65 million years ago yeah but we find it, it, it was unexpected by the old earthers that there would be soft tissue because soft tissue degrades very quickly yeah. in all even in the most preservative climates of being in a deep freeze mm-hmm. it is still degrades over time and can't last more than a few thousand years and here it is they have to come up with a rescue device for over 65 million years <laughs> but it that. makes perfect it makes perfect sense that there would be soft tissue if Billions of dead things were buried by a flood only 4,500 years ago. That's exactly what we would expect as young earth creationists. So that yeah. finding soft tissue, and it's not just dinosaur bones. Let me tell you about this. Uh, there's a, a name by uh, a guy by the name of Dr. Brian Thomas. He's with oh, Institute yeah. for Creation Research. I've had him on my show. Great guy. He is great. I love listening to his his presentations. He keeps a Google Doc that's free for everyone to see. We can link it, hopefully, in the show notes of... Uh, soft tissue found in regions, uh, layers that are too old to hold that uh, that soft tissue if it's been being dated by the old earth methodologies. Mm. And he's got over a hundred different examples of soft tissue, whether it be a uh, plant or uh, he's got a gastropod egg, a cuttlefish ink sac that are buried in layers that uh, the secular scientists have dated to be hundreds of millions of years old. He's got one in here that's over 550 million years old. Come on, yeah, and, and, and it's these are these are all published in the scientific peer-reviewed articles. Uh, I'll send you that link so you can put it in the, uh, the show yeah notes yeah done. please do please do. But he's currently got one. It's an updated list. He's got 116 different examples of wow. these soft tissues that should not exist if indeed they're as old as the old earthers think. Amazing. Uh, I just looked here. There's one that's over 950, almost a billion years old. <laughs> Precambrian chitine from glucose. Uh, they found it in a Canadian Arctic. And it's in Nature's article, whatever. Anyway, crazy. Did, did you... Soft um, tissue cannot last that long. Apologize. Did you ever hear about the guy who thought he was dead? Yes, this is another joint, Jason Lyles. But go ahead and tell. Yes, me. You, you probably tell it better. I love it. No, no, no. It's so good. There's a there's for those who don't know. There's this man who he thinks he's dead, and he goes to the doctor uh, because all of his family members are just so distraught. They say, they say, Charlie, you're not dead. You're alive. We're talking to you. He says, No, no, no. You don't understand. No, I'm dead. You you think I'm alive, but I'm not. I'm dead. Uh, and they say, um, well, look, you, you know, we're, we're talking to you and he goes, well, I, you know, it's, it's, it only appears that way. And they say, well, look, we, why don't you go to the doctor and get an official diagnosis? And he says, all right, yeah, I, I can do that. So he drives to the, to his general practitioner and he goes in and the doc says, Hey, Charlie, how you doing? And he goes, Oh, not too good doc. You know, I'm dead. And, uh, the doc says, you know, you're, your family members, they told me that you think you're dead, but, but, but look, I, I, I want to tell you, I, I, I'm listening to your heart. I'm checking you out. It, you're, you're alive, Charlie. You're not dead. And the man says, no, no, I'm, I'm dead doc. It's, it's way worse than you think. And the man says, okay, well, well, look, why don't we do a test? Why don't we see, why don't we see if you do something that dead people can't do? And then we'll know that you're alive. You're not dead. Does that sound good, Charlie? And Charlie says, yeah, yeah. Okay, that sounds good, Doc. Well, what are we going to do? Because I know I'm dead. The doctor says, well, Charlie, do dead men bleed? And he says, no, dead men don't bleed. I, I know the heart stops beating, the 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 veins, all the, the blood in the, the veins just stops flowing. So no, dead men don't bleed. The doctor says, okay, watch this. And he takes out a, um, a needle and he, really quick pricks the man's palm, the palm of his hand. And he looks and there a red dot forms. Sure enough, Charlie is bleeding. The doc says, Charlie, do you see this? You're bleeding. Now, what do you think? 
And Charlie looks at his hand and he goes, well, what do you know, Doc? I guess dead men do bleed. And so you're getting the exact same thing. It's a funny story, but that is exactly what happens with old earthers and paleontologists when they uncover this kind of irrefutable proof of young earth. Now, irrefutable, the only irrefutable proof we truly need is God's firsthand testimony in scripture. But from a scientific perspective, they have irrefutable proof that these dino bones are young. They just must be young. They can't fit the old earth time scale. So what do they do? They say something along the lines of, well, what do you know? I guess soft tissue can survive for 68 million years in a T-Rex fossil. And it's it just, it leaves all of us young earth creationists, all of us Christians just slapping our foreheads in unison going, what the heck is it going to take? And that's where you, that's where presuppositionalism comes in. And we say, okay, evidence is not enough. They have enough evidence already. You're never going to change a heart through evidence. And that is what is needed, is it's a heart change. They need to be shown the truth of God's word from the inside. The Holy Spirit has to show it to them. And so we love the evidence, but it only goes too far. It only goes so far. Joel, what a great connection. I'm, I'm glad you told that the way you did because you, you brought it just exactly back to where it is. <laughs> 65 million, uh, a, a dinosaur soft tissue does last for 65 million. <laughs> that's a, that was a great connection. I love how you did that. I love it. Perfect emphasis. Love it. But that's that's really, that's the perfect place to stop because that's what I wanted to bring it back to is that in the end, when we, when we argue back and forth with people over evidence, that's what you get. You get this, well, I'm going to protect my worldview in the end. So, we always want to turn it back to God's word. And who is Jesus? Are, am I a sinner? Do I need forgiveness for my sins? Mm. Uh, and so the age of the earth, in principle, doesn't matter at all. It's what does the Bible teach? And are we faithful interpreters of God's word? Right. Where, there are, where there are discrepancies between what modern paradigms, which are constantly changing. I've got a, I've got a, bl a blog post about how the pa paradigms are always changing. It used to be that there was, uh, you know, um, Phlogiston and uh, abiogenesis, all these these paradigms have changed over time. And, you know, I'm old enough to remember the food pyramid and when there was <laughs> going to be global cooling. And yeah. these paradigms have fallen to the side and it won't be long in a hundred years. They'll look back at the paradigm now and laugh and say, why yeah. did those crazy people believe in evolution? Because we've got some other naturalistic formation of uh, plants and animals that doesn't require a god. So mm. As Christians, we must hold true to God's word. That is our foundation. That's where we stand strong. Yeah. And when someone wants to argue evidence with us, we say, well, how do you know this? We, because the evidence does correspond to God's word. It's the interpretation of the evidence that is always going to be incorrect. So we want to we want to stay strong on God's word. And uh, anyway, I kind of got, got carried away there at the end. But yes, all the evidence does support a young earth. It's the interpretive framework that is put up thrust on it by the old earthers that push it towards the way they believe in accordance with this modern paradigm. Yes. I love that. And just, just uh, because we're bringing this home here, we are getting comments on YouTube and Joel Donahue asked this question. He said a serious question though, why does the age of the earth matter? It doesn't change the gospel and isn't a salvation issue. If it's purely for entertainment purposes, that's cool. I just don't get it. And I want to piggyback off what you said there because I thought what you said was very, very good. It doesn't matter of itself, but it matters if that's what the Bible teaches. And um, here's where I'm gonna I'm gonna just drive that point even a little bit further. Here's another reason why the age of the earth matters. And and this is one of the things that I love about uncovering the biblical truth and the ev the um the the actual scientific evidence that corroborates what we already know to be true from the Bible. And that's this. One of the greatest, uh, uh, one of the most destructive worldviews in human history has been Darwinian evolutionary theory in all of its forms. And there's been punctuated equilibrium. There's been, like you said, apologize, there's been all these different paradigms that have fallen by the wayside. But Darwinism as a worldview, as, as, a, as um, a, a human origins explanation has been done so much damage 
in our world. And it has led to all kinds of other destructive ideologies. Um, just the very idea that we are beasts has had far-reaching implications for human behavior and human hope and uh, faith in scripture because people, the, as a matter of fact, people might say it doesn't matter, but people do look at scripture and they do say, wow, if evolution is true, the Bible doesn't seem to be teaching that. Therefore, the Bible must have issues. The Bible must be wrong. Or maybe the, maybe we are dealing with non-overlapping magisteria where you've got Bible on one hand, science on the other. And, and so what I love about biblical, what I love about talking about young earth creationism is this. If the Bible does teach a young earth, and if young earth theory is true, then evolution is not possible. Now I know, even on an old earth timescale, evolution still doesn't make sense. I totally get that. We can pre-sup the daylights out of out of uh, Darwinian, Darwinian evolutionism. We can do that 100%. But if the Bible is true and, and if the earth is young, there is no way. It, it just, it completely destroys, it obliterates old earth Darwinian thinking. And here's why I love that because it leaves no room for the theory that you are a beast, that you are the product of time and chance acting on matter through random processes in an unguided, ungoverned universe. It leaves no room for materialistic determinism, which I know is the hot thing right now. People say we don't live in a random universe. We live in a materialistically determined universe. Guess what? The implications are exactly the same. You're still a randomly assembled or an, at least an unguidedly assembled collocation of atoms with no eternal significance. And, and that is not true. The same Bible that teaches that the age of the earth is about 6,000 years, give or take, is the same Bible that says that you and your life are cosmically significant. And that means that your moral choices matter. If you're just a rock, if you're just pond scum, if you're just an evolved newt, your moral choices don't matter. But you're not. You're a man made in God's image. And that means your moral decisions have cosmic import. And that means you better figure out what to do about the fact that you've been making morally bad choices and being a fool. I'm not saying that's a rag on anybody. I've been a fool myself in my life. But the same Bible that says that we have been foolish, because the fool says in his heart there is no God, according to Scripture, is the same Bible that also says that we can be redeemed. And there's only one possible way to be redeemed. The same Bible that teaches a young earth is the same Bible that says that Jesus Christ became a man like you and me, became our high priest and laid down his own life to redeem sinners like you and me. And we must be saved by the Savior God sent. We haven't really talked about it, but Jesus did affirm a young earth. Jesus talked about how Adam and Eve were made male and female at the beginning of creation. Paul talks about how the invisible attributes of God have been clearly seen since the creation of the world, from the creation of the world. In other words, there were people around to see it at the creation of the world. So, the same Bible that teaches young earth teaches that you can be forgiven, you can be redeemed. And that happens through the God-man, Jesus Christ. And so, yes, young earth is not a, a salvation issue, but it, it does have great importance for how we view Scripture and how we trust Scripture. And when you trust Scripture, you realize that um, your conscience is not lying to you, you have sinned, and the wages of sin is death, and you do deserve condemnation, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And young earth creationism obliterates the greatest, most destructive competitor to that worldview, the biblical worldview, in the last 200 years. So I love young earth creationism. Um, I think that not only is it true, but it's also good, and I think that it's beautiful when it leads to a robust gospel presentation. So I wanted to make sure we went there today because I want to invite our listeners, if you don't yet know Jesus, today would, would be a great day to hit your knees, to pray to the Lord Jesus, to, to apologize for your sin, to return from your sin, and to turn to Jesus Christ. That's what Apologetai has done. That's what I've done. Look, we're not any smarter than you. 
We're not better than you. We've just been saved by a, a God, a God man, Jesus Christ, who's better than all of us. So I want to leave you guys with that. Thanks, Joel. I know we didn't get to all the questions and maybe we'll have to cobble together a part two where we can talk about the flood a little bit. You know, mm -hmm. that's one of my favorite topics to talk about. Absolutely. Uh, but in, in closing on, on my end, if someone wants to be a consistent Christian who holds to an old earth because they see uh, the scientific paradigm as, as a magisterial authority. And because the science says that I need to reinterpret the Bible, then to be consistent, you also have to question the resurrection. You have to question the virgin birth. You have to question whether Jesus walked on water because none of those things are scientifically possible. Right. In the same way that you would hold that young earth creationism can't be possible because of a scientific view, then you must be. Then you need to be consistent throughout Scripture in the way you're interpreted. Mm. That neither can Jesus have walked on water. Neither could a virgin have a have a baby. Neither could a man come back from the dead. Those are all scientifically impossible things. Right. But if those things are true, then you can't have something against the young earth model because the same God who revealed in Scripture the Genesis one account, uh, the fall into sin, the literal fall into into sin, the flood, uh, all the other miracles. A consistent Christian will understand all of those as God's interaction throughout history, his redemption purposes to glorify his son. So thanks, Joel. I enjoyed yeah. my time with you tonight. This is great. Look at that, 11 o'clock, right on. Right on the dot. Where can people go to get more of your stuff, Apologetai? Uh, you can see my blog posts at Apologetai.com. Uh, I'm fairly active on Twitter. Uh, Apologetai with an underscore. Somebody has squatted on the... Uh, original apologetic without the underscore name but i have to have an underscore on mine mm. so anyway thanks for having me joel i enjoyed this i enjoyed talking about the bible and uh, my lord and savior so let's do this again absolutely uh really enjoyed it thank you so much and uh just to give my my own closing this has been a production of the think institute we are a christian educational and evangelistic organization that helps Christian laymen, guys who aren't pastors, but who are serious about making an impact for the gospel in their families, their local area, and their church, we help those guys to become the worldview leaders that their families and their churches need. So typically, not new Christians, but guys who have been around for a while who are trying to live a Christian life. Now, if you are a new Christian, you're, of course, welcome on this train. We'd love to have you. But one of the greatest ways to get in touch and is to join our community. We have a free community. It's on Facebook, the other social network. And you can join it by searching for Think Squad, T H I N K S Q U A D. That's where you're going to be able to join over 900 others who are on the same journey as you, becoming the worldview leaders their families and their churches need. And you join there, you get the resources that we're putting out, and you get to join a community of like minded men who are on that same journey. And you get to share your skills and your interests and your ideas. One more thing check out our podcast. It's called Worldview Legacy. We are talking about this stuff all the time. Every week we answer a different question that guys like you are asking, questions that you yourself are asking. And if you're not, your coworkers are and your kids are. Maybe you and your wife are going to talk about one of these questions uh, during one of your, your pillow chats uh, you know, in a few weeks. But you want to be prepared for that. You want to be ready for that. And so listening to the Worldview Legacy podcast is a great way to get prepared to become the worldview leader your family and your church and your local area need you to be. So that's my shameless plug. Not so shameless. Thank you for listening to this Twitter space. Really appreciate all of you who listened, who participated. If you're watching on YouTube or Facebook as well, thank you guys. Really appreciate you guys. Until next time, this is Joel Sedeckes and Apologetai signing out. Thank you.